Hi, everyone. Welcome to the channel. My name is Nick Cosgrove, and I am back with this week's No Filter Q&A. This is the episode where I answer all questions related to diet, training, and supplementation that I've received over the last seven days from our in-house clients, online clients, as well as a few of our online followers. Remember, if you have any questions related to your nutritional plan, workout program, supplements you're currently taking, not taking, considering taking, please feel free to email me those questions at nick at foreverfitperformance.com, or you can DM me your questions on my Instagram at fitcosgrove underscore. All right, let's get started with this week's no filter Q&A with question number one. Nick, I don't think my body is able to add on any muscle. I've been training for over a year now and look the exact same from when I first started. Is it possible that some people just are not able to add muscle to their bodies? Uh, no. <laughs> We all have different types of genetic capabilities of what we can and cannot accomplish with our physiques, right? You have people who are the genetic elite. Those are the ones who usually end up on the Mr. and Mrs. Olympia stage, right? Um, and then you have people who have what we call this average genetics, right? I use myself as an example here. I, I mean, I was never born with superior genetics by any means. Um, I really feel like I've had to work really hard for every little ounce of muscle that I put onto my frame. And then there's other people that can go into the gym, both men and women, train for six months and develop an amazing looking physique. And that just comes down to their genetics, right? Um, but we all have our, like I said, we all have our genetic capabilities. We also have our limitations, right? So I don't think that you cannot put on any muscle to your frame, but can you look like a fitness model on the cover of a magazine? Well, maybe not. No, but forget about that. Don't worry about that. Just focus on what you can do and what you can accomplish with your genetics, right? So when you tell me you have, you're have, you looking the exact same, what I would be saying to you is I would be looking at your nutritional plan and dissecting your training program, okay? Because if you haven't added on any muscle in one year, then there's something going on with either your training program, nutritional plan, or both, okay? Um, because even people with the shittiest genetics can build great aesthetics, right? Um, you just have to know how to fine tune your program and how to customize your training program and your nutritional plan to work towards your genetics, your lifestyle, and your goals, right? And this is where sometimes it comes down to working with a knowledgeable, reputable personal trainer coach that can guide you. Um, like when I work with uh, different clients, I, you know, if I'm working with someone who's more of an ectomorph body type, someone who loses weight very easily, but has a very difficult time building muscle, I'm going to train them a little bit differently than someone who's an endomorph, right? Who an endomorph is someone who puts on body fat quite easily, but has a really hard time um, losing weight, right? So they put on muscle and fat easily, but they have a really hard time losing body fat, right? So if I'm going to work with someone who is, let's say, an ectomorph, I'm going to put them on a higher caloric diet as well. So because I know that their metabolism is so fast, they're, they're going to burn through those calories. So I have to feed them more food. Whereas if I'm working with an endomorph, I'm going to feed them less food, right? If I'm working with an ectomorph, I'm going to train them a little bit heavier in the gym with maybe a little bit less volume, but with heavier weights, fewer reps. Um, if I'm training someone who's an endomorph, I might give them higher reps and higher volume, right? So it really depends on the genetics and the type of like body that you have, right? But to sit there and say that I don't think I can add muscle onto my frame, no. Uh, you know, it, it's... I've never worked with anyone who has not developed some form of results from training consistently in the gym day in and day out for never mind a year, but even like six months, people start to notice changes. So if you're not noticing changes in your physique, what I would be doing then is I'd be dissecting your training program and taking a really good look at your nutritional plan, because I guarantee you that there's something there that you're not doing. And it could be both. Okay. So whether it's, you're not training intensely, you're not training uh, methodically, you know, you're not dieting intelligently. So these are all things that you have to really look at and be honest with yourself and say, okay, am I doing everything I possibly can with my genetic capabilities? Okay. And my genetic limitations, but be very careful about getting in your head and saying, well, this is the best I can do because you truly don't know the best you can do until you've really used all your resources possible. Right. And that means that you've trained in and out consistently in the gym, that you've tried different types of training styles. You've used drop sets, supersets, giant sets, 
uh, circuit training, right? Basic straight set training. You've trained with a few different types of personal trainers to get their views. You've tried different uh, nutritional protocols, right? Whether it's carb cycling, ketosis, intermittent fasting, you've tried different dieting trends just to see what works well for your body. And only then will you know if you've actually reached your genetic limitations, okay? But in my opinion, I have never worked with anyone who has truly hit their genetic limitations because most people don't train to that extent, okay? They're not in the gym five, six days a week for years on end. They're not eating clean 100% of the time. So if you're doing all that, then you, yeah, I would say you've hit your genetic limitations, but I guarantee you that you're doing something wrong. And, you know, if you're, if you want to work with a trainer, reach out to me. Uh, we, I'll take a look over your nutritional plan, take a look over your training program, take a look over your supplement protocol, and I can see, uh, help you see where we're, you know, you're, you're going in the wrong direction and get you back in the right direction. All right. Uh, next question. Uh, Nick, I watched your video on cellulite and found the advice you were providing to be inspirational. I thought there was no chance for me to reverse any of the cellulite on my inner thighs and glutes. Just curious if you recommend training the areas that have cellulite more often, as in three to four times a week, or should I just train these areas once a week like other muscles? Yeah, good question. So I wouldn't necessarily recommend training the muscle groups that have cellulite on them with more um, volume, okay, or more frequency. Okay. I, I would train them like any other muscle group, but what I would do is I train them with the utmost amount of intensity. And as I mentioned last week or two weeks ago, when we talked about cellulite, I think that was the episode I put out two weeks ago in the middle of March uh, with regards to cellulite. So if you haven't seen that, go on the YouTube channel and check out the uh, episode. I think it was episode 150 on if you can get rid of cellulite. Okay. So I always say, yes, you can, right? And I talked about that you know, it depends on how much cellulite you have and how long you've had it for and your age. So there's factors that take into consideration. But I do believe that you can get rid of some cellulite for sure by weight training. Um, but again, I wouldn't necessarily mean uh, have you be doing weight training with necessarily che heavy, heavy weights, nor would I be saying to do, let's say it's in your inner thighs and glutes, like you say, squatting three, four times a week. I think you're just going to overtrain the muscle. So what I would recommend doing is just train the muscle group once a week. But when you're training, for example, legs, incorporate those drop sets, incorporate those supersets, incorporate circuit training, right? Um, that's what's going to get rid of the cellulite, okay? And that, in addition to following a good diet plan, will help eliminate that cellulite. And as I mentioned on the channel two weeks ago, once you get to that point after a year, maybe a year and a half of training like that, and there's still some cellulite, then you can go down the surgery route, right? You can look into laser surgery, right? There's there's other forms of surgery out there that can help get rid of that cellulite. But I do think that you should do it in a natural way first. And I don't recommend training it with more frequency or more volume. I just recommend training more intelligently, again, more methodically, right? So you incorporate those supersets, throw in the giant sets, throw in the circuit training, keep trying to shock your body to the best of your ability, okay? Um, so if you're training your legs once a week, you got to go into that leg workout and hit it with the utmost amount of intensity. And usually, and I recommend this too for women is I usually recommend uh, incorporating two leg workouts per week, but two separate leg workouts. So one leg workout where you're, you're focusing more on, let's say your quads. And the second workout, you're focusing more on your hamstrings, your glutes, and your calves. And that way you're getting two lower body workouts, but they're two very different lower body workouts. And because of domes, the late onset muscle soreness, my recommendation is to put those two workouts on back-to-back -back days. And that way, let's say you do your quads on Monday, you know, if you're someone who trains regularly, you're going to be sore on Tuesday, but you're going to be even more sore come Wednesday due to delayed onset muscle soreness, which usually takes about 48 hours to kick in. So that's why I recommend, you know, your quads on Monday and then you go into the gym on Tuesday, you knock out your hamstrings, your glutes, your calves, well, your legs are starting to get sore, but they're not too sore. And then you'll have about five days off or six if you take an extra day of rest before you hit the lower body again. So I find that works really well for women. Incorporate two leg days, but don't start squatting three, four times a week. Don't start doing straight leg deadlifts five times a week. Don't do any of that stuff, okay? Because all you're going to do is you're going to overtrain the muscle and it's gonna, not going to respond. Okay, so don't train it with more frequency. Don't train it with more volume. Train each muscle group once a week, but train it with the utmost amount of intensity. All right. <clears throat> okay. Uh, Nick, what's your opinion on a keto diet? I would like to lose about 20 pounds before summer and I've heard good things about this diet. So I've spoken about the keto diet in the past quite a bit. 
Um, so here's my problem with the keto diet. I've yet to meet a single person who has done the keto diet and has been successfully able to keep the weight off. Okay. So I've met lots of people over the years who said, oh, keto has worked great. The Atkins diet worked wonders for my body. I'm like, great, but you, you put the weight back on. Oh no, well, I came off the diet. I'm like, okay, so it wasn't a good diet. Okay. And I've talked about this before. What makes a good diet? A good diet is a diet that is sustainable and realistic. Keto is not sustainable. It's not realistic. You can do it for a short period of time. I've known people that have even done it for six months to a year, but eventually they come off the diet. And what happens when they come off the diet is their body has become overly sensitive to carbohydrates. What happens when your body becomes overly sensitive to carbohydrates? It takes it in like a sponge and it goes onto your body like body fat so quickly. I've seen it time and time again, okay? It's not that your metabolism slows down, it's just your body is overly sensitive to carbs. It doesn't know how to break it down, it doesn't know how to digest the carbohydrates. So therefore, you get the, 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 the extra calories coming in from the carbs, carbs get stored as body fat, okay? So the only time I will put someone on a ketosis diet is if I'm working with someone who is very overweight, like we're talking morbidly obese. Uh, I've had two people come to work with me in the last year who were 300 plus pounds. I put them both on ketosis diets for about six to eight weeks. I think one person I put on for two months, the other person for six weeks, just to lose those initial 30, I think 30 in one person's case, it was 40 pounds, okay? After that, I put them on a um, moderately high fat, high protein, and then low carb diet where I rotate the carbs from a week to week basis, okay? Do a macronutrient rotation plan. Um, so there's a time and place for keto, and that's when I use it. Very rarely will I use it in a contest prep. Maybe the last few days, if I have someone who's a little behind and needs to make weight, I might put them on a ketosis diet, but that's only so I can get them to drop the water weight and get down to the weight to make it on stage for their class. But that's the only time I recommend using it. Again, the best diet, and I hate using the word diet plan, but the best nutritional plan to follow is one that is sustainable. Okay, so it's one that you can sustain for life. And I always tell people, why not try to train your metabolism so that you can eat more food, right? That you can consume more calories. I mean, that's the best type of diet because for me, I love eating. So I want to eat lots of food. So how can I train my body to consume tons of calories? Well, build more muscle because again, the more muscle mass you have, the more calories you burn in a rested state. So if you're able to build a foundation and build lots of muscle, you can consume tons of calories. I've said this to clients before who, you know, they've come to work with me and they've been working with me for a year or so and say, I, you know, I think I need to lose 20, 30 pounds. I say, great, you're going to lose those 20, 30 pounds much more quickly if you just dial in your diet now because you have all this muscle mass. So two years ago, when you didn't have all this muscle mass, it would have been much more challenging you for to lose to lose this weight. But now that you've built a foundation and you've added on some solid, lean, dense muscle, your metabolism is going to be quicker, right? I truly believe that you can retrain your metabolism to be faster. And I believe that you with muscle mass, that's what I mean. So if you build muscle, you're going to be burning more calories, okay? So your goal should be to say, well, how can I consume more calories? And that's how you do it from weight training, okay? So as far as your uh, diet's concerned, I'm not a big fan of keto. I'm not really a big fan of intermittent fasting. Um, I'm not a big, big fan of the if it fits your macros diet. I'm a firm believer in macronutrient rotations on a week-to-week -week basis. So one week, let's say your carbs are high, one week your fats are low, one week your protein is moderate, and then switch that all around for the following week, right? I find that works exceptionally well for people who are following a regular weight training program in addition to a cardiovascular training program, okay? Um, that, in my opinion, of 20 years of designing nutritional plans for people, that type of plan seems to work the best, okay? So that's what I'd recommend doing. And if you're not sure how to do that, that's when I recommend working with an online coach, a nutritionist, a dietitian that can help guide you in the right direction. But I would not recommend keto, not because it doesn't work, because it does work, but because it does not work long term. So you lose all that weight short term, but you're going to put it all back on as soon as you come off the diet. All right, uh, next question. Uh, Nick, I can't lose my belly. I weight train four times a week and eat clean foods about 75% of the time. Do you think I should get my thyroid checked or is this just due to age? I'm 55 years old. Um, you can get your thyroid checked if you yourself feel like your thyroid has slowed down. Um, but chances are it's not your thyroid. Okay. <laughs> Usually there's um, other symptoms when you're having a thyroid condition, like you're feeling fatigued all the time, right? And you're actually putting on weight more consistently. So if you're not putting on weight, you're just having a hard time losing weight. 
it's most likely not your thyroid, especially if your energy levels are consistent, right? Um, but with that said, if you feel like you should get your thyroid tested, by all means, get your thyroid tested. Um, but what I'd recommend doing in your case, <laughs> you know, you say your diet is clean 75% of the time. Why not bring it up to 95% of the time? You know, that additional 20% can make all the difference in your midsection, right? In addition to that, again, I would just like in the first question, I would really be going back and dissecting your training program. Are you doing everything you possibly can in the gym? Okay. And, and, you know, a lot of people, they don't want to accept the hard truth. There are people who think they're working out, but they're not working out. I've had people come to work with me and they're like, holy shit, I've never trained like that in my life. I'm like, but that's how you should be training. You should be giving it your all in the gym to the point where when you're done, you're, you are done. Like for myself, even after all these years, when I finished my last set, there is no way I could do one more set. I'm done. I'm My body is depleted, right? Um, like I'm shaking. <laughs> So, and that's how you should feel because then you know that you've, that you've really done everything you possibly can in the gym to maximize your results, right? Um, so I would be looking at that. And a lot of people don't want to accept that. You know, if you're someone, like I mentioned before, if you're someone who takes out your phone during the workout right away, I can tell you right now, you're not training intensely enough. There's no way, okay? You need to be lasered focused in your workouts. And I've talked about how when I work with clients on the floor, my clients easily get in anywhere from 48 to 62 sets in a 60 minute workout. That is crazy volume for 60 minutes. That's like one set per minute. And like, we're, that's not even including the drop sets that we do on top of those sets. So, I mean, that's the way you should be training. So I would be looking at your training program in addition to your nutritional plan before you start uh, thinking, you know, it's my thyroid, but you know, get your thyroid checked. But in my experience, very rarely is it the thyroid. It's usually that the training program is not intact or there's something wrong with the nutritional plan. It's one or the other, or it's both. Um, again, if you're experiencing these issues and you're saying, you know, I've done everything I can, is it my genetics? You know, is it just that I'm getting older? These are, you know, excuses. That's all they are. Okay. It's not your genetics. It's not that you're getting old. It's that you're either you're tra not training intensely enough or you're not dialing in your diet enough. It's one or the other or both. And this is where it comes down to working with a good coach or trainer that can help you by holding you accountable, by guiding you in the right direction. And it always helps to have a second set of eyes that's going to be critical and not tell you what you want to hear. Because that's what friends and family do. They'll say, oh, you look great. Oh, you're looking amazing. You're doing such great progress. If I have a client who's not making progress, I make sure they know they're not making progress. And then I say, okay, well, what do we have to do here? Do we have to like change your diet? Do we have to change your training program? Do we have to do a full 180? But that's what people need. They need someone in their corner that's going to tell them the hard truth. Okay. And if you're not getting results, and if you have a belly and you feel like, you know, you're, you're busting your ass in the gym, but well, you feel you're busting your ass in your gym, but maybe you're not, maybe you're not going to the utmost amount of intensity that you possibly can. Maybe your diet is not as clean as you think. I work with a lot of people who think they're following a clean diet, but then when they give me a sample of their three day log, I go, Oh my God, the amount of sugar that's in your diet. A lot of people don't know about dietary nutrition and that's okay. That's why it's important to work with someone that can help you. Okay. That's why we have fitness professionals in the world that can help people guide them in the right direction. Cause there's a lot of misinformation out there, especially online. Okay. So that's why we're looking at it. take that diet up to 95% clean foods, make sure you're training with the utmost amount of intensity. If you're starting to second guess yourself, hire a reputable and knowledgeable and experienced personal trainer slash coach that can guide you and steer you back on the right path. That's, what's going to help you get rid of that belly. Okay. It's not, it's not your genetics. It's not your age. It's the work ethic and it's the diet. All right. Uh, Nick, I remember you saying that the metabolism doesn't slow down with age. I don't disagree. However, why am I not, sorry, why am I not able to eat the same types of food now that I'm in my thirties that I could eat when I was in my twenties without putting on weight? I exercise the same now as I did when I was in my twenties. So what's causing the weight gain? Uh, good question. So I get this question a lot, actually, from people and say, you know, I, I, I'm i doing everything that I did when I was in my 20s or some people who are in their 40s and they say, hey, I was doing everything I did in my 30s. And for some reason, I'm starting to put on weight now. And, you know, they'll say, is it my metabolism? I'll go, no. And they'll say, is it my thyroid? I'll go, no. I mean, it very well could be your thyroid, but chances are it's not. As I mentioned in the previous question, very rarely it's not. Okay. What it can come down to, though, is your hormones. Your hormones change as you get older, right? So even though you might feel you're doing the same amount of activity that you were doing in your 20s, 
chances are you're not. And you might be doing, let's say, say you used to go for a 30 minute run every day when you're in your 20s and you're still doing that 30 minute run. There's a good chance you might not be moving as fast as you used to move, right? And it's not because you're getting older necessarily. It's just because your hormones are changing too, right? So your energy levels change. You just might not have that same amount of energy you did when you were in your 20s. So therefore, you're not going to, your caloric exponential, what you're going to exert, your energy is not going to be as much, right? So this is why I tell people as you age, you have to modify your training and your diet as you become older, right? It, and I, I've said this before, it's not your metabolism. It's not your metabolism doesn't just slow down because you're getting older. It's just that you yourself slow down with life. Um, you know, and as we get older, yeah, we are going to get a little bit more tired, right? That's normal. So because of that, though, you have to factor that in and say, okay, well, how can I modify my training program to account for the fact that I'm now 38 years old? I'm no longer 25 years old, right? Or if I'm in my 50s, I'm no longer 40. You know what I mean? So you've got to modify accordingly. Um my workouts, for example, there's the same intensity that I've always given. I, I really try to give the utmost amount of intensity with every single workout. But I also have more wear and tear on my body. So certain exercises I did in my 20s, I'm either no longer doing or I'm going a little bit lighter or I'm taking longer to warm up on. Them, okay, And that's just training smart, right? Because you want to last. <laughs> so the same thing with the diet. You know, as, as I've gotten older, there's certain foods that I know my body just can't tolerate anymore. Uh, whether I've developed an allergy to those foods or just my digestive tract rejects them, now I have to modify my diet, okay? And I don't like to use age as an excuse, but you do put on more mileage the older you get. But as long as you're staying consistent in the gym and consistent with your diet, age shouldn't really have a factor on your weight, okay? Um, I, I've had a lot of people, and I have a lot of people I work with who are in their 60s and 50s who look better now than they did when they were in their 30s and 40s because they've dialed in their diet and now they're exercising on a consistent and regular basis. Okay. So that's what this comes down to. So again, don't get too caught up on the whole age is uh, an excuse or my metabolism. Okay. It's none of this stuff. And I, I, this is, this is a good topic again, because I'm getting a lot of questions on this now. It's not the fact that you're just getting older and you need to accept that you're going to look like a pile of shit. Okay. Cause it's not true. The people who get older that end up looking like a pile of shit are people who live a lifestyle full of, you know, bad foods, inactivity, set at entry lifestyle. Those are the people that end up with the big bellies. Those are the people that end up with health problems. Those are the people that have heart conditions, right? Uh, of course, you know, you can get sick. You can have diseases. There's sometimes genetics. Even the healthiest people get sick. But you want to give yourself the best chance, the best odds of if you were to get a disease, you were to get sick, that you have the best chance of fighting off those diseases. And the only way to do that is by making sure you yourself are fit and healthy. And the only way to do that, get your ass in the gym and follow a clean nutritional plan. All right. Uh, Nick, what do you think about meal prep companies? Are they a waste of money or is there any value in this service? Um, there's value in this service if it's going to hold you accountable for your diet. So for example, someone like me would get no value in this because I actually enjoy meal prep. I do it all the time. As I'm filming this q and I'm meal prepping right now. I have my chicken in the oven. I have my rice in the rice cooker. And I have actually my yams in the oven at the same time. So I'm, I'm actually meal prepping right now. Um, so I would have no value in a meal prep service company. But if you yourself is someone that, you know, you get a little bit lazy when it comes to prepping your food or you just don't, you're not a really good cook then yeah, I would definitely enlist in the services of a meal prep company because if you're enlisting in the services of a meal prep company and it's a company that is known for providing clean whole food sources like chicken and rice, uh, you know, flank steak and yams, uh, quinoa, salmon, like good foods and they're portioned out, that's going to help you stay on track of your diet, right? If you're someone who is very lazy when it comes to meal prepping and you just kind of wing it, it's not going to help your results, right? Like you might be training every day in the gym. I know people like this who train every day in the gym, but then they go to McDonald's afterwards, right? Or they go to um, a fast food joint, another fast food joint, and they just grab something quick and easy. Or they, dra they grab a sandwich from a cafe. Like that's not going to help. So that's where these meal prep companies, I'm a huge advocate of using these companies. If you know that you yourself are just not disciplined enough to prepare your food ahead of time. Okay. Um, again, for someone like me, I enjoy prepping my own food. In fact, I actually like cooking my own food. I don't want someone else cooking my food. I like to know exactly 
what goes into my food. I know my portions. It doesn't take me long. I've talked about this before. You know, I usually whip up about 49 meals in less than an hour every week. It takes no time. That's me though. Okay. Um, I, I've developed that discipline to do that. I have lots of clients that have that discipline as well. But I also have lots of clients that use these meal prep companies because either they know themselves, no, they're not disciplined enough, or they really are busy. I have people who run companies and they, they work seven days a week, like 12, 16 hours a day. So for them, it makes more sense to hire someone to prepare their food in advance so that they don't have to do it, right? Their time is more valuable in a sense that it makes more sense that for them to put their time towards running their company than taking an hour or two away to meal prep for the week. So I see no, no problem with meal prep companies. Do I think they're overpriced? Probably. I mean, I've seen some of these companies selling chicken and rice for like 14 bucks. I'm like, chicken and rice doesn't cost more than three bucks to make. And I'm talking like organic chicken with like whole grain rice. So it's a, it's a big markup. But I mean, you know what? You're paying for the convenience factor and it's saving you time and it's holding you accountable. So therefore, if you have the funds, I would say use it. I think that they're very valuable. It's a very valuable tool source to use for someone who has a hard time staying disciplined with their diet and is not going to be uh, preparing every meal in advance. Because if you don't prepare in advance, chances are you're going to shit the bed on your diet. In, in most cases, that's what I see of most people who, you know, they usually shit the bed on their diets is because they're not planning ahead. All right. Uh, Nick, I'm in the process of trying to get pregnant and my family suggests that I stop lifting weights to ensure a smooth pregnancy and less, less risk to the baby. Do you think it's dangerous to be lifting weights and exercising intensely while pregnant? Uh, absolutely not. Okay. I do not think it's dangerous. Um, now, of course, you're going to want to be communicating with your doctor and your trainer to make sure you guys are all on the same path while you're going through your pregnancy. But I have never, ever seen any complications from working with any women who have been pregnant. And I mentioned this before. I've trained with women who passed their due date and still are in the gym four or five times a week training. If anything, being fit and healthy, exercising regularly, being stronger, having more muscle, it should make your pregnancy more smoother. Being unhealthy, sedentary, not doing any activity, that's not setting yourself up for the best pregnancy. In fact, they're probably going to make your pregnancy much more challenging. So I always uh, tell my female clients, the more fit you are going into your pregnancy, chances are the easier that pregnancy is going to be. It's not going to be a super easy pregnancy. I mean, not, some people have very difficult pregnancies, right? But the more fit you are, the better your chances, the better your odds of having a smoother pregnancy. And in my opinion, yeah, the healthier the baby will be. Right. And so I, I wouldn't say it's risky for the baby. Um, now, obviously, as you go further into your term, you're going to want to avoid certain exercises. Are you going to still be squatting super heavy weight? Probably not. Right. Are you going to be doing sit ups and leg lifts? No. But you can modify your program accordingly as you go a longer, longer into your pregnancy. Right. And again, communication is key. So that means communication between your doctor, your personal trainer and yourself. So all three of you are on the actual same path. And if you're not working off a trainer, just make sure you communicate with your doctor and let your doctor know what you're doing. I always tell clients, you know, if they're choosing a doctor to help them get through the pregnancy, make sure you're working with someone who is well-educated on exercise science, okay? So that you don't get one of those old school doctors who say, you know, don't push yourself too much. Because in my opinion, working with tons of women over the years who have had babies and working with them while they're pregnant, weightlifting has helped them, Okay. And they would all agree that weightlifting has made a huge difference in their lives. And it made them more fit for their pregnancy. It got them ready to have their babies. And what's funny is every single one of those women that have worked with me, they're back in the gym like two, three weeks after they delivered. So the recovery time is better. So no, I, I don't agree with your family. I think that's a very old school way of thinking. And that's why I always tell people, if you're going to work with a doctor when it comes to, or if you're going to work with a doctor when it comes to really anything, you should be working with a doctor that is well-educated on exercise science and nutrition, okay? That understands the benefits of weightlifting, that understands the benefits of doing cardiovascular activity, right? The whole idea of take it easy, rest, I disagree with this. I think we should always be doing something. Our body craves activity. It doesn't need to be super intense. You don't need to be going for a 10 mile run. You don't need to be squatting 315 pounds when you're pregnant. But I do think you should be doing something, whether that's just walking, speed walking, whether it's aerobic exercise, like in the pool, um, it could be very lightweight training, circuit training, something just to get your heart rate up. This is good for us. Our body craves activity. 
Okay. So I would disagree with that. I think that everyone who's pregnant should be working out. Just communicate with your doctor, communicate with your personal trainer, modify your workouts as you go further into your pregnancy term. All right. Uh, Nick, I would like to become a professional bodybuilder. I have saved up enough money to take the next year off from working so that I can spend more time in the gym working out. Do you think it's possible to get my pro card in one year if I dedicate the entire year to training, eating, sleeping, and supplementing on the dark side? <laughs> um, okay, first of all, I wouldn't give up your job to become a professional bodybuilder. Professional bodybuilding does not pay a lot of money. You know, the only guys who make money in bodybuilding are usually the top five at the Olympia level. The rest of the guys, most of them have to have an actual day job to be able to support their bodybuilding career. Okay. So I would not recommend, uh, you know, stop work completely and just focusing on eat, sleep, train. Okay. Now, if you have a sponsorship, different story, but chances are, if you don't have your pro card yet, you don't have a sponsorship. So I would not recommend that. Um, now, can you get your pro card? Maybe. I mean, I don't, I don't train you. So I don't know what your genetics are. I don't know what, how long you've been training for, um, your age, right? These are all factors to take into consideration. Um, and also it's just really sometimes just comes down to luck of the draw. I mean, when I used to compete in shows, they'd only give out one pro card at the national level. These days they give out like two or three per class. So it's like they're giving away pro cards like candy now. So it's a lot easier to get your pro card now than it was 10, 15 years ago. Um, you know, you get a lot of people on Instagram who say IFBB pro, but they've done two shows to get there. And there was only like maybe one or two people in their class, or sometimes they're the only ones in their class. I know a few bikini girls who actually won their pro cards and there was only like two or three people in their class. Right. So it's a lot different now than it was 10, 15 years ago. So because of that, I feel that that federation, the IFBB has been quite diluted. And that's not an insult to competitors. It's just that it's almost like you're just giving your the cards away to anyone, right? So because of that, there's less sponsorships too. Um, sponsors, they want to really throw their money at the elite, the elite of the elite. So someone who's got that pro card from beating out some really tough competition, right? Someone who's marketable. Um, but again, you know, I would not recommend stopping what you're doing for work. Uh, when I used to train for shows, I was working 12, 16 hours a day on very low carbs, sometimes no carbs, um, doing two hours of cardio on top of that. I still managed. So you can still work and have uh, a bodybuilding lifestyle. Ronnie Coleman, <laughs> he won his first Olympia and he was working full-time for the police force. So yes, genetic elite again, but it you didn't have to stop working. So can it be done if you dedicate a whole year of eat, sleep, and train? Possibly. But this really comes down to, you know, you say supplementing with the dark side. Okay, I, I, I assume you understand how to supplement with steroids. Fine. But again, this will come down to your genetics, how hard you train, how disciplined you are with your diet, and who shows up on stage next to you. If you show up at a competition where everyone is like a perfect 10, <laughs> chances are even if you were like, like a perfect 10, you're not going to win, right? So again, I would not put all your apples in one basket and say, well, I'm just going to focus this whole year on getting my pro card. I would see how you could do first at a few local shows and then see where you, where you line up. Okay. Um, you know, I, like myself personally, I knew I didn't ever have the genetics to get to that next level. And I didn't really want to take it up a notch with the uh, supplements. Okay. I didn't want to go to that dark side and do more and more stuff just to get a pro card. It wasn't worth it to me. Okay. To me, it wasn't worth taking 10, 15 years off my life for a pro card that's really not going to get me anything, right? So you have to really, you know, monitor your progress and review your goals and say, okay, well, how important is it for me to have this pro card? And do I really have to sacrifice this much to get it? Um, but again, bodybuilding doesn't pay the bills. So I would not recommend giving up your day job to chase a dream of becoming a professional bodybuilder that once you have that pro card, if you get that pro card, is really not going to give you much financial uh, income unless you are in that top five percentage of the bodybuilding industry. All right. Uh, two more questions. Nick, I joined a gym and was paired up with a personal trainer that is not even in shape. I don't want to come off as a jerk, but I have a difficult time taking diet and training advice from someone that is easily 30 to 40 pounds overweight. Do you think this is an acceptable reason to ask the gym to provide me with a new trainer? Interesting question. Oh, I like that question. Hmm. 
Yeah. I mean, you don't want to body shame anyone, but you'd think if someone's a personal trainer that they practice what they preach, right? Uh, I, I don't consider myself to be in the best shape of all time, but I do practice what I preach. I train on a regular basis. I follow a clean diet 80 to 90% of the time, right? So because of that, I feel like I can kind of walk the walk, <laughs> talk the talk, but that's a tough one because I, I can see where you're coming from, right? I mean, if you're working with a trainer or a coach, it's someone who's there to motivate you right? and inspire you. And if it's someone who is overweight, that's not very motivating or inspiring. But with that said, I know quite a few coaches out there, especially older coaches who, yeah, they, they, they might not be training the gym six, seven days a week like I am anymore, or they might not be following a super clean, disciplined nutritional plan but they know what to do to get that physique to the next level. Um, but again, that's because they're experienced, right? And they've done this time and time again. So what I would be doing first is maybe asking that trainer, hey, do you mind if I um, see some of your other clients' progress uh, pictures, right? Or testimonials. And if that trainer can't produce those testimonials or those client progress photos, then maybe you say, you know what? I don't think we're a good fit and yeah, ask for a different trainer. Um, but don't just assume because someone's in great shape. That doesn't necessarily mean they know their stuff. I know a lot of trainers who are in great shape, but you know what? They don't practice proper training programs for everyone, right? They might do what works for them, and then they try to give it to someone else who's elderly or someone who is obese or someone who's completely new to the gym, and then they end up getting injuring them, right? Or they try to give them a diet plan that they can follow. If I gave clients the diet plan that I follow, most of my clients would become obese. I mean, I easily consume over 10,000 calories a day. Most people can't do that. So you have to make sure as a trainer, whether you're in good shape or bad shape, that you're actually programming for the person you are working with, okay? So not just doing what works for you. And I've said this before, I don't train my clients, or some of them I do, but I don't train all my clients the way that I work at, right? Because that's what works for me. So I try to find the formula that works for them, each individual. But I understand what you're saying because you do want to work with someone who motivates you and inspires you to go to the gym. And that's very hard when the person themselves are not really in the best of shape. But again, don't just assume that they don't know what they're talking about just because they're not in the best of shape. You know, they might not be practicing what they preach, but they might know how to get you from, you know, point A to point B. So I would first judge by how the trainer is actually training you. Have you actually even done a session with this trainer? Maybe this trainer, even though he or she is not in the best of shape, knows what they're talking about, knows how to train you. So I'd give them the benefit of the doubt and try one or two sessions. But if you don't gel well, you know, yeah, definitely ask for another trainer. I don't know how it works with commercial gyms, like how you get paired up with trainers. But I mean, if you're paying for the service, I would ask for a different trainer. Um, one of the things we do with our company is we always tell clients, we'll refund you for any unused sessions. So if someone books a 30 session training package and after five sessions, they're like, this isn't right for me. I'm like, no problem. We'll refund you for the other 25 sessions. No, no questions asked. Um, and you know, it's never happened, but at least it gives the clients the confidence to know that if they don't like the service they're receiving, or it's just not a good mit, a good match with the trainer, they can leave, right? There's no, they don't have to make any commitments. So I think that's important too, that you have the freedom to say, well, I don't want to work with this person. Let me try someone else, but be very careful of just judging someone based on how they look, because I've seen it on both ends. Okay. I have seen some really good trainers who are not in the best of shape, but they know their stuff. And I've seen some trainers who are in excellent shape, but excuse my language, but they're dumb as fuck. Okay. So just be very careful as to who you take your advice from. But I do understand that you'd want to work with someone who at least has a physique that you can respect and you can admire and say, you know, I'd like to look like that, or I'd like to look something similar to that right? Because that will motivate you to go to the gym more on a consistent basis. And I do think as a personal trainer slash coach, it is your job to stay in shape year round. That's my personal opinion. And that's why I practice good nutrition and training. Plus I love it, but it's something I practice on a daily uh, basis because I should be able to practice what I preach, right? So I do see where you're coming from. But like I said, don't just assume because someone is not in the best of shape, they don't know what they're talking about because they very well could be. They just they might not be very disciplined themselves with their diet and their training program. All right. Last question. Uh, Nick, I feel as if I can go hours without eating, but as soon as I do eat, I am hungry within, within an hour afterwards. I hate this feeling because I tend to binge and overeat on anything I can find in the house. Is there anything I can do to stop myself from feeling so hungry after I eat? 
Yes, stop going hours without eating and make sure you're consuming fats in every single meal, okay? So this is very common. So I get a lot of people, they won't eat breakfast, for example, and they won't eat lunch. They'll go the first like 12, 14 hours of their day and they'll have their first meal at three o'clock. They're not even doing intermittent fasting. They're just, they're not hungry. I mean, I guess they're doing a form of intermittent fasting, but they're not purposely doing intermittent fasting. So what's happening is, you know, they, they go that prolonged period of time. And once you go a certain period of time of eating, you're right. You're just not hungry. Um, the problem with that though, is when you start eating now, you've all of a sudden you've boosted your metabolism, your metabolism has woken up and it's looking for more food. Now, if you're someone who is eating sporadically and you're eating every like maybe six hours here, and then you go 10 hours without eating and you eat like three meals in one hour, your blood sugar levels are going to be all over the place, especially if you're eating a fairly high carbohydrate diet. Okay. So this is why I tell people to have smaller, more frequent meals throughout the day. Even eat when you're not hungry. You know, I, I personally eat 10 meals a day. Now, I'm not telling you have to do that. But, you know, I have a lot of clients, most clients that work with me on the nutritional plans, I'll have them eat anywhere from five to seven meals per day. But they're very small meals. And they're being fed every two to three hours. And what that does, it helps keep your blood sugar levels stable and your insulin levels uh, stable as well. So no, neither are fluctuating up and down. So you're not getting those crashes and you're not trying to crave more food. Another thing I recommend is implementing a good healthy fatty source, fatty protein source in every single meal you have. Okay, so whether that's peanut butter, avocado, extra virgin olive oil, salmon, um, just something that's a good fatty protein source because fats will keep you feeling fuller for a longer period of time, number one, and it'll also help regulate and stabilize blood sugar levels that you do have from your carbohydrates. And once again, if you are going to consume or you should be consuming carbohydrates, not necessarily in every meal, but you should be consuming carbohydrates. If you're having, say, six meals a day and at least three to four of those meals, there should be carbs. My recommendation is to make sure you're consuming complex carbohydrates, not simple carbohydrates, because they definitely will, simple carbohydrates will spike your blood sugar levels. That's going to make you crave more food. Okay. So your body's actually not hungry. It just thinks it's hungry. So it's starting to crave that food. So you've got to make sure you're incorporating good, healthy fats, moderate complex carbohydrates, and moderately to high protein sources, lean protein sources. Okay. Smaller, more frequent meals. I know it's a very generic saying, but it does work. Okay. And it's not because it's going to keep your metabolism going or any of that nonsense that you've heard. It doesn't do anything like that. It doesn't That doesn't like make your metabolism go faster, burn more calories. It just allows your body to stabilize your blood sugar levels, your insulin levels, so that you're able to perform at optimal levels throughout the day. And that's what I've told people before. There should be no period of time in the day where your energy levels are like this. If your energy levels are like this throughout the day, let's say you crash at one o'clock and you need caffeine to pick you back up again. There's something wrong either with your sleep or your diet, okay, or both. Um, I said, I, I've said this time and time again, I feel the exact same energy at 6 a.m. as I do at 5 p.m. It doesn't change, okay? My energy levels are the same, and it comes down to diet. And that's why I always try to get my clients to feel, too, with their energy levels. I want their energy levels to remain the same at all periods of time throughout the day, okay? That's a good diet plan to follow. That means you're getting a good adequate amount of sleep, rest, hydration, um, and your you know your training is optimal. Everything is in place. Okay, so I, that's what I would recommend. Don't go hours on end without eating. Make sure you're you're using fat in your diet. This is very important. Try to put a good healthy fat fatty protein source. If it, I recommend in every meal, but you know at least five six meals a day, smaller meals, and that should really help. Okay. It'll stop you from overeating. And one more thing, hydrate. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very important. A lot of times people think they're hungry and they're really, they're just dehydrated. So I always tell people you should be looking to get in at least minimum two liters of water a day. Okay. So you can take it in regular water. You can take it in the form of BCA powders like I have here. Um, mm -hmm. Just make sure you are getting your water in regularly. All right. That's it for this week's No Filter Q&A. This episode will be going up on Monday, April the 8th. As a reminder, if you do have any questions related to your diet, training, or supplementation, please feel free to email me those questions at nick at foreverfitperformance.com, or you can DM me your questions on my Instagram at fitcosgrove underscore. I want to thank you all for watching. I want to thank everyone for supporting my YouTube channel, supporting my in-house and online personal training business, my online coaching app. I really appreciate all the support. Thank you all, and I see you all next week. Bye for now.